for that introduction, Darren. Um, thanks everyone for joining me today. Uh, today I'll be going over my dissertation, which is Molecular Evolution of Predatory Traits in Rattlesnakes. Predatory traits are traits that are, allow one organism to eat another organism. These are really useful probes for adaptive evolution since they're directly tied to fitness and typically they're pretty easy to identify in nature. So courtesy of FSU's very own Dr. Greg Erickson, bite force is a really important predatory trait for crocodilians uh, that reflects what their diet is. Um, all traits, including predatory traits, are to a large extent products of genes. And uh, the histories of those genes uh, could tell us a lot about how um, different traits evolved. And so, for example, if we follow the keratin genes in birds, uh, we see that the evolution of certain keratin genes corresponds very closely with the usage of talons uh, in predatory birds. We can also use genes to get a better idea of how different animals interact with their surroundings. For example, vision is one of the best studied sensory systems, and we're actually at the point now where um, we can predict what wavelengths of light certain animals can see directly from their gene sequences. So in other words, we can take a drop of blood, pull the DNA from it, and then predict what colors that animal can see. Um, in fish, this was actually used uh, to predict at what depths certain fish evolved in based on what color uh, or what light, available, what light was available at those depths. I think everyone that's here today would agree that pit vipers are masters of predation. This is thanks in part to their uh, precise venom delivery system, which includes large kinetic fangs. They're also uh, successful ambush hunters, and they have prey-specific venom toxicity. They're also ectothermic, which means that they have very low metabolic needs, and this allows them to be opportunistic. But I would argue that what's probably more interesting is that pit vipers are masters of perception. After all, the first step in predation is perceiving your prey. Traits are optimized through the process of natural selection, and this is in part driven by the co-evolution of predator avoidance in prey. Sensory perception must work, so to speak, in order for venom to evolve, and I like to illustrate this by saying, if you can't find it, you can't kill it, and you can't eat it, since failure at any point uh, has the same fitness outcome, which is a hungry snake. So to summarize my, my research, uh, my initial goal was uh, to try to figure out what are the genes that allow rattlesnakes to detect their prey. Uh, from there, I investigated if venom ontogeny can deepen our understanding of trait regulation. Then I looked at if life history uh, had any influence on sensory perception in rattlesnakes. Then I looked at if we could find molecular evidence for trait integration between sensory perception and venom. And last, I wanted to know, could molecular mappings in just one species uh, reflect macroevolution? So for the bulk of my research, my focal species was the eastern diamondback rattlesnake, Crotalus adamantius. They're the largest species of rattlesnake that can get up to two and a half meters large, um, and they're native to the southeastern United States. As far as their ecology and life history, uh, we can thank our local legend, uh, Dr. Bruce Means, for giving us by far the most complete account of this species with his book, Diamonds in the Rough. Uh, contrary to what most people you know, initially think about rattlesnakes, they're actually fairly complex. And I wanted to pull a couple of my favorite examples from Bruce's book uh, to try to illustrate this a little bit. So, um, of course, first up, rattlesnakes can eat really big meals compared to their body size. Um, so this is an example where a rattlesnake ate a rabbit that was basically the same size as the rattlesnake. Uh, so this is, this is pretty remarkable. Um, but they don't start out eating rabbits that big. Uh, they actually go through a pretty radical transition, both in body size 
and in their diet. So you can see, based on uh, gut contents from a small study that Bruce did, um, the juvenile snakes had 100% rodents in their diet. Um, as they moved to adults, the diet shifted uh, to about 75% by weight being made up of uh, rabbits. And so this is a pretty uh, big transition in dietary preference. Uh, like most pit vipers, rattlesnakes actually make pretty good mothers. And so they give live birth to their offspring, and then they actually babysit and guard their offspring, uh, which is a form of parental care, until the rattlesnakes are old enough to go off and fend for themselves. And this is usually after their first shed. So you can see here, this is the mother rattlesnake with all of her offspring around her. And meanwhile, while the mothers are doing all the important work, the males are out just fighting each other, as males do. Um, but this is actually a really interesting uh, male-specific behavior where if two males converge on a pheromone trail uh, to a potential mate, they do this, it's kind of like a glorified thumb wrestling match, they try to push each other down, uh, but they never bite each other, it's kind of a way for them to resolve you know, who gets to continue on the trail and which one has to clear off. Um, and even though they're really successful predators, um, they still have some natural threats. And so, uh, for example, they have natural predators, which include birds of prey, and they're also susceptible to things like wildfires. And so returning back to my project, um, I think the most well-known predatory trait that rattlesnakes have is their venom. And we actually have a fairly good understanding of how their venom works. It's well characterized. Uh, we know that it consists of around 130 toxin genes, and we uh, have a pretty good understanding of what each of those toxins uh, do individually. For their sensory traits, rattlesnakes rely on four generalized senses. These are their sense of sight, their infrared or thermal sensing, which relies on their pit organs, um, sense of touch, and chemoperception. Um, and so for the genes that uh, code for these traits, uh, let's start by going over what we already know from the literature. First, we know that rattlesnakes have three functional photosensory genes. Uh, these include the long wavelength sensing opsin, the short wavelength sensing opsin, and rhodopsin. And we know that they have two primary heat sensing genes, which are both expressed in their pit organs. These are the TRPA1 and the TRPV1 uh, genes. And for their mechanosensory ability, uh, we can approximate this with around 14 genes, and this is fairly conserved across all vertebrates. However, we really have no idea what kind or how many genes make up their chemosensory repertoire. What we expect is, um, we expect to see uh, chemoreceptors that are expressed in the olfactory bulb, which is up here, and the vulnerable nasal organ, which is down here, and the vulnerable nasal organ relies on picking up scents with the tongue and manually delivering them to two uh, bifocal lobes. So in order to characterize all these genes, uh, we needed a reference genome assembly for this species. Luckily, I wasn't the only one in my research group that was in need of a genome, so the first part of my project overlapped with a pretty huge uh, collaborative effort to try to get the best possible genome for the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. <laughs> um, after about two years of troubleshooting and sequencing and uh, more troubleshooting and annotating the genome, uh, we finally ended up with a really high quality chromosome resolution genome uh, representing the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Um, for the people here that may not be as familiar with molecular biology, uh, each part of my project fits into what we call the central dogma, um, where the DNA codes for the instructions to make certain protein products, and the intermediate between that process is RNA. Uh, so for example, when I'm talking about the genome, we're referring to the DNA, uh, which is you know, the, the source code uh, instructions for making the protein products. Um, but later on, I'm going to talk about gene expression, and that's just going to be us measuring the number of RNA that's getting made as an approximation for how much of a certain protein is getting made. 
Just like with anything new in science, uh, the first step was to compare what we had just done with what's already been done before. And uh, currently, the only other rattlesnake genome that's resolved up to the chromosome level is for the prairie rattlesnake, Protolus virius. And so um, what we did was compare what our genome looked like compared to that genome. What we're looking at is, on the left side, all of these uh, white um, all these white rectangles are each of the Easter Diamondback chromosomes. And then on the right side is the same thing for the prairie rattlesnake, but shown in gray. So those are all the chromosomes. Um, what we see with the colored lines going across, those are con connecting conser conserved busco loci. So these are conserved genes um, where if our genome agreed with th this genome, then we would see these clear bands going across, um, which is, you know, in fact, what we do see. If we zoom in down at the bottom, we can see the sex chromosomes, and um, this is uh, something I really wanted to point out, is we decided to do our genome on a female rattlesnake, and females are the heterogametic sex in rattlesnakes, so our genome animal had a Z chromosome and a W chromosome. The prairie rattlesnake genome was for a male, and it has two copies of the Z chromosome, so we expected, if we got the W chromosome, to see nothing connecting to it from the male rattlesnake, and that is in fact what we saw. So this is pretty good confirmation that we correctly um, identified the W chromosome. So using our genome, uh, we were able to recover the complete venom gene repertoire and the surrounding genomic architecture. Uh, so we're not the first group to be able to find ge uh, genes from a snake genome and annotate them. But we are the first group that was able to get the complete venom regions as completely contiguous. And what that means is there's no scaffolding in any of these regions. We got every single nucleotide for that venom region accounted for. Um, so this is going to be important later on when we start talking about regulatory mechanisms and trying to capture exactly what's going on with these genes. For the chemosensory genes, we found two main sets of um, G protein coupled receptors that were both abundant and widespread throughout the genome. Um, and so I, it's a little hard to read, but the different chromosomes are colored by different colors. So the first of these groups were the olfactory receptors, or ORs, and we found close to 500 copies of these genes. And so these are putatively functional genes. And we also found about 300 of these were on the Z chromosome. So that was, that was interesting and unexpected. The second group are the type 2 glomerular nasal receptors, where we found close to 700 copies of these genes, and again, a little over 300 copies on the Z sex chromosome. Just to give you an idea of what these receptors actually look like, uh, here are some really basic 2D illustrations of how, they, uh, how the protein structure looks bound to a cell membrane. Um, and so you can see the olfactory receptors are quite a bit smaller than uh, the V2Rs, and also the V2Rs uh, form dimers, so it takes two copies to make a functional receptor, whereas the olfactory receptors are monomers, um, where just one copy is believed to form the functional receptor. Um, but what's important is uh, some of the protein sits outside of the cell, and we predict those regions are more likely to interact with scent-binding molecules. To wrap up the genome part of my talk, I just wanted to compare what, overall what we found in the rattlesnake genome compared to the human genome. And before I go on, no, we don't have Darren's whole genome sequence. <laughs> um, at, at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, but we do, uh, this, so what I used was one of the open source human genomes and just tallied up genes based on that. Um, and surprisingly, we got pretty close numbers of total genes between the two genomes. Um, and what I was really ex uh, excited about was we got similar numbers of transcription factors, too. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk more about transcription factors a bit later. Um, but also we found the rattlesnakes have way more chemoreceptors than the human genome. And then obviously rattlesnakes have venom. Uh, humans don't have venom, or shouldn't have venom. 
So to recap the first part of my talk, what are the genes that rattlesnakes use to find their prey? And these are the ORs and the V2Rs, which uh, we found were spread across the genome. And we also found more than half of this diversity all occurs on chromosome Z. Next up, I wanted to dig into the genetics of venom ontogeny in this species. Um, their venom composition and functional toxicity changes drastically throughout, uh, throughout their lifetime. And um, this is believed to overlap with that huge shift in prey preference that I described earlier. So the first thing I did was I confirmed agreement uh, with prior characterizations of venom genes that were done using transcriptomics. I then measured gene expression using venom gland uh, RNA-seq using 18 individual rattlesnakes. And I was able to find significant aged biased toxins based on their expression. Uh, this is what we call a volcano plot, uh, where the x-axis um, has a lot of full change of expression, and um, this is representing all 18 rattlesnakes. And so anything that is over a lot of full change of one is uh, biased towards adults, which I show in red, and I try to keep the red um, color consistent throughout my talk. And then anything less than negative one is um, bias towards juveniles, and I try to use that uh, throughout my talk as well. Um, and so all the biased genes are colored either red or blue, except for the venom genes, which I showed uh, in green so they could stand out a little bit. So either biased, I showed the venom genes in green. Um, and we could actually see that a lot of these are among the most uh, strongest biased genes based on their expression, both in the adults and the juveniles. So if we just focus on those green genes and look at them in a heat plot, um, we can see the ontogenetic shift a little bit more clearly. Uh, so uh, for this plot, each row we're looking at is a different venom gene, um, and each column is a different individual rattlesnake. And we have these, they're ordered based on their size. We used uh, the length of the snake as a proxy for age. Um, so the, all the way to the left, this is our, our smallest juvenile snake. And all the way to the right, this is our largest adult snake. Um, each of the cells are colored based on the di differential expression, where if we have a lighter color, then that's higher relative expression. If we have a darker color, that's lower relative expression. So this big block of light color up here, these are all of our adult biased genes. And then down at the bottom left, these are all of our juvenile bias genes. And so we can see very clearly a pretty big transition between the adult phenotype and um, the juvenile phenotype. To try to get a deeper understanding of how these uh, predatory traits are regulated, uh, we next tried to figure out what controls the shift between the juvenile venom to the adult venom. We did this by investigating uh, networks of regulatory proteins that are called transcription factors. And we expect the transcription factors that regulate predatory genes uh, should also be affected by prey-based selection pressures, since they're important to uh, predatory traits. Um, and we also looked for changes in the accessibility of certain DNA. These and other uh, regulatory mechanisms are collectively called epigenomics, or epigenetics. So to pre briefly review, um, this is how DNA is packaged into chromosomes, where the relationship with histones uh, dictates how accessible certain regions of DNA are. So um, for example, here it's packaged tightly. We can't get into this region of DNA, whereas here they're opened up. And so this region of DNA is now accessible uh, for transcription to occur. Uh, this, this is my really, really basic uh, diagram of what a transcription factor is. Basically, it's just a protein that can swing back and influence the transcription of other uh, genes, or potentially even itself, or even other transcription factors. And that is the beginning of the iceberg of why regulatory genomics is really complicated. Transcription factors bind to very specific segments of DNA, um, which we call uh, binding motifs. And we can actually look for these binding motifs and make predictions about how the mechanisms are actually functioning uh, relative to what genes they're found around. 
So for Venom, we wanted to establish a regulatory framework that we could begin to repeat later on for the sensory traits. We performed ATEC seek and cut and run um, on venom gland tissues and used these to evaluate accessibility. So ATEC seek relies on a TN5 transposase and is a little bit more general in the regions that it gives you, um, whereas cut and run is a little more specific and it uses a defined antibody and we use the H3K27 acetylation antibody to try to target open enhancers. And using both of these methods, we were able to find differentially accessible regions. Um, this is how I, I like to show all of these different um, sequencing techniques all together uh, to try to make sense of it. And so on the top, we have all of our gene annotations. And so, you know, this is a region of the genome on chromosome 9, where we have a really important set of venom genes. And I colored each of these genes, so that's what these arrows are on the top. I colored them based on what their bias was, so adult bias, juvenile bias. Underneath, I aligned uh, the accessible regions that we detected using ATAC-seq and then cut and run. And I also colored these if we found an accessibility bias. And um, as you guys can see, we, we actually found that uh, genes that we found with bias expression overlapped with regions uh, where we found biased accessibility. And so, for example, on this left side, you can see the juvenile bias is overlapping with juvenile um, ex bias accessibility. And then same thing over on the right side for some of these adult genes. And this relationship we figured out was statistically significant. To take it one step further, we then tried to figure out if we could find uh, uh, binding motifs in these differentially accessible regions and start to piece together uh, hypotheses for specific regulatory um, mechanisms that are happening to control this ontogenetic shift. Um, and doing this, we were able to predict the top set of candidate transcription factors um, that are controlling this ontogenetic shift in venom. Um, and part of how we did this was by, again, using expression bias on those particular transcription factors. So bias transcription transcription factors based on their expression from their genes. But this, is, this was by no means uh, a simple thing to try to interpret, and this diagram is only, the whole point is to confuse you, because <laughs> it confused me, and I was trying, you know, I, I thought, oh, if I create the networks, we can, you know, they should all cluster together in one neat little spot. But if you see all the biased transcription factors are spread all over this massive network, um, among the other transcription factors that are expressed in the venom glands. Um, so there's still a lot that we need to do to figure this stuff out, but um, one of the interesting things that did pop out was we found this circadian rhythm cluster, which, you know, circadian rhythm is a, a biological timing function, and so we think that this is probably um, one of the more important pieces to controlling the ontogenetic shift in venom. As a final test, um, I wanted to compare transcription factor motifs uh, in the eastern diamondback with another species that does not have the same drastic ontogenetic shift in venom. Um, so the western diamondback rattlesnake, which is the one that I show underneath, they don't have this major ontogenetic shift in venom. And so what we predicted was the transcription factors that are controlling the ontogeny shift in the eastern diamondback um, we found motifs around the genes that we predicted are being regulated. And so we predicted that in the Western Diamondback, we should not see those binding motifs. We should see a drop off of those um, since their venom does not change uh, ontogenetically. And uh, we, that was indeed what we actually found. And so this is one example of that, um, where I zoomed in and there's five different mutations that changed the binding specificity of this particular transcription factor at this region. So um, this was a really you know, compelling evidence that we successfully identified transcription factors and predicted their activities in regulating the ontogenetic shift in venom. And so just to recap on this section, I uh, wanted to know whether venom ontogeny can deepen our understanding of trait regulation. And we found that venom expression and chromatin accessibility overlap with one another, 
And we also found that transcription factor expression and uh, motif distributions could be used to predict their function. All right, so now turning our attention back to state chemoperception, I wanted to try and begin uh, characterizing the hundreds of ORs and V2Rs that I found based on life history and gene expression. So specifically, I tested to see if age or sex had any influence on uh, the expression of these chemoreceptors. Oops. So again, just like venom, uh, we looked at ontogeny, but I also added sex to this because we expect rattlesnakes to rely on chemical cues for some of the sex-specific behaviors that I showed you in the beginning of the talk. To do this, we uh, performed RNA-seq on olfactory and vulnerable nasal tissues. Um, we had a little bit better sampling for the olfactory because um, it was harder to figure out how to get the VNO samples, um, and it took us a little bit uh, to get consistent sampling on those. And we found biased chemoreceptors in both of these tissues, and we also found biased transcription factors in both tissues. So just like before, this is a volcano plot, and here we're looking at uh, the uh, olfactory, olfactory epithelium, and we found five olfactory receptors that were all biased towards juveniles. And so I showed those in orange here. Now, if we look at the same plot for the vulnerable nasal tissue, we see something completely different. Um, we actually found an overwhelming developmental signal in the vulnerable nasal tissue, um, where basically all of the V2Rs are only turned on in the juvenile snakes and they're turned off in the adult snakes. Um, and our best uh, hypothesis of what's going on here is that when the snakes are younger and they're developing the VNO, uh, they're expressing all of these genes, and then later on in life, there's a much lower or zero expression of them, um, and they kind of refine the pathways of their sensory system. Um, so, yeah, so very different here. And so yeah, the V2Rs are all these pink genes here, and they're all on the juvenile bi bias side. Um, unfortunately, since all of the expression was in the juvenile snakes. We didn't have enough samples that had expression to be able to do a sex bias test, so we only uh, were able to capture um, this major ontogenetic signal that we found. But for the olfactory receptors, we could look at sex bias, and we did actually find a bunch of um, olfactory receptors that were all biased towards male, so that's the blue color here, and then we found a couple that were biased towards females. Um, interestingly, all of the male biased olfactory receptors are all on chromosome Z, and two of the female biased ones are also on chromosome Z. So there's some interesting stuff going on here um, as far as sex bias expression on chromosome Z. Uh, in addition to the biased ORs and V2Rs, we also found some biased transcription factors that um, included two things that I thought were worth noting. The first one is we found the female bias transcription factors were dominated by W chromosome genes. So that means all those transcription factors are coded on the W chromosome. Um, and so this could potentially be a mechanism for controlling dosage compensation. But we'll have to look at that a little bit closer to know for sure. Second, two of the adult bias transcription factors were also found in the venom glands, and this could be um, this could coordinate ontogeny between the two tissues. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the next session. So just to recap, we wanted to know, does life history influence sensory perception? And I found a huge VNO developmental signal in addition to age and sex bias, olfactory receptors, and transcription factors. And then I also identified the W chromosome as a potential source for dosage compensation for chemoperception. Next up, I wanted to go over some evidence that I found uh, for integration between sensory perception and venom. First up, as I was just talking about in the previous section, I found overlap between adult bias transcription factors in the venom gland and the olfactory bulb, 
Uh, these two genes are called FLS and SPI1, and they're both members of the AP1 activation complex. And uh, these could coordinate shifts in venom in, um, between venom and ORs as they begin to target rabbits. And so this is kind of a hypothetical scenario where as the diet starts to include rabbits, this AP1 complex uh, upregulates both the, the venom genes and the ORs that are involved in finding and eating rabbits. I also unexpectedly found evidence for physical linkage between the sensory genes and venom on chromosome 2. And um, I'm uh, predicting this could potentially be an envenomate and relocate predatory loci. If we zoom in um, on the left side, we can see all these purple genes. Uh, these are all V2Rs, and they're immediately adjacent to um, genes that code for a myotoxin gene. And then further down on the same part of the chromosome, we see um, a handful of olfactory receptors that are immediately adjacent to the L amino acid oxidase venom toxin gene. And so a potential scenario could be, uh, do these V2Rs on the left um, detect cues that are triggered by myotoxin? And then do these olfactory receptors detect cues that are triggered from the prey in response to this L amino acid oxidase? We don't know for sure, um, but um, we need to do some linkage disequilibrium population level studies to be able to hash this out. And um, hopefully we'll get to do that at some point. So to recap, is there molecular evidence for trait integration? And I found transcription factors um, that had overlapping adult bias were found in both the venom glands and the olfactory bulb. And I also found evidence for physical linkage of V2Rs, ORs, and venom genes all on chromosome 2. So for the last part of my talk, um, I wanted to try to quantify the total olfactory receptor and V2R gene diversity that I found in the eastern diamondback. And I wanted to do it by combining phylogenetics and protein inference. I did this using maximum likelihood gene trees, and I used the gene trees to then measure selection based on DNDS ratios of the genes. I then compared selection uh, between different protein regions, and finally I overlaid all of the molecular findings that I've described so far back onto these gene phylogenies. Um, to try, try to give us a really thorough um, representation of these traits. And again, this is all just looking at the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake. So I know it's a little bit hard to see everything here, but just keep in mind the point of this is to try to capture everything we know about ORs on one figure. So um, first off on the tree, um, I know it's hard to see, but the Branches where we found positive selection are colored a shade of green, where the lighter colored green reflects more sites with positive selection detected on that branch. Um, I also included expression results. So there's a, these two rings going around the tree with sex and age, and these reflect our um, biased expression tests. And I decided to also include a um, less stringent cutoff for these, um, which was just a p-value that was significant. Usually uh, the cutoff that I used was a p-value and a log full change of one. And I showed um, the lower cutoff as a smaller rectangle and then the more strict cutoff as a taller rectangle. Um, that was the best way I could come up with to try to visualize this all together. Um, and then the last thing is at all the tips of the tree, I included this uh, circle that was scaled based on average, uh, average expression. So across all the samples, what the average expression was based on transcripts per million. And then those circles, I colored based on what chromosome they were on. So all of those purple ones, those are all found on chromosome Z. And I thought it was pretty uh, interesting that a lot of the or I guess most of the Z chromosome olfactory receptors kind of form their own clade, and then the autosomal ones also form their own clade. And so that just means that the sequences are more similar um, based on where they're found on the chromosomes. Um, so again, I did the same thing for the V2R tree. Um, and again, we found that the uh, chromosome 
placement naturally separated out into these two major clades. Um, but I'm sure the first thing you guys all noticed was this giant thing that looks like Jupiter right in the middle. <laughs> and I thought the same thing, and it turns out that this is the only V2R that is found on chromosome 5. And it's also responsible for around 10% of all of the expression that I found in all the V2R genes. Um, and I thought that was really weird. And so um, I wanted to dig into it a little bit deeper and try to see if I could start to trace the evolutionary history of this gene um, back on, on more of a macroevolutionary scale. And to my surprise, uh, this gene turned out to be highly conserved and I was able to actually trace it across vertebrates going all the way back to fish. So, in the way I did that, it's um, uh, a process called gene syntony where we look at the genes around the gene that we're interested in and make sure that they're all the same. And I found that both the genes that were downstream and upstream from this gene were all conserved and they formed this very conserved cluster. Um, and I was able to find that cluster in the genomes of all of these different animals. And so, um, I'm 99.99% confident that this is the same gene in all these species. Um, and I also, since I know it's the same gene, I wanted to take it a step further and try to see if we could look for important uh, locations on the actual protein where positive selection is happening. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the fuchsia spot, shown over here. Um, that corresponds with where the star is on the tree, and um, what it reflects is that at some point during the transition, the transition from uh, amphibians, and so I have a frog up here, uh, between amphibians to the ancestral reptile, there was um, selection to change the protein at that position um, on, on the receptor. Um, so that could correspond with the shift from a more aquatic to a terrestrial environment. Um, at this green position, I found really strong positive selection between a lizard and between the lizard group and the snake group. And so, if you guys didn't know, snakes evolved from lizards. Uh, they lost their legs and um, basically evolved from a lizard ancestor. And so, I found really strong positive selection to change the protein um, between lizards and snakes. And so, this could be um, corresponding with. Uh, the snake version of the vomeral nasal system with a more precise forked tongue setup. All right, so just to summarize this section, um, can the molecular mappings in one species reflect macroevolution? And I found that the sex chromosomes are a crucial evolutionary driver for say, snake chemoperception, and we should look at the evolution of the chromosomes to get a better um, holistic idea of how these traits have evolved. And I also found one V2R that was really highly expressed, and I was able to trace it all the way back across vertebrates and look at its evolution in deep time. And so now um, I've addressed all my major points, I can take a step back and just kind of reflect what was the point of doing all this? This was a ton of work. And is there any real-world application <laughs> where we can use this stuff? And one of my biggest drivers uh, throughout all my research has been getting to the point where we can predict key ecological factors directly from the gene sequences. Um, so in other words, I want to be able to take a drop of blood from a very vulnerable species, such as this transverse non rattlesnake, and be able to identify what the top ecological priorities are um, for that species without having to do any invasive population level monitoring or anything like that. Um, and so I also think that anything that, any addition to our understanding of how snakes uh, use chemoperception could be useful for uh, managing invasive snakes. So for example, uh, the invasive snake, uh, brown tree snakes on Guam, and then the invasive pythons in the Florida Everglades. Uh, one side project that I wanted to do a brief shout out for, I'm really excited about. Um, so uh, this is Tyler, um, Tyler Hunt, he's here today. He's in, he's, he's in Greg Erickson's lab. His project is super cool. He's looking at the visual fields in crocodilians, and he worked with the College of Engineering to come up with this really elaborate apparatus to measure their visual fields. 
Somehow, I convinced Tyler that it would be a great idea to uh, hook up some rattlesnakes to this thing and try to capture their visual fields. And uh, to our surprise, it actually worked really, really well. It turns out if you measure an animal that doesn't have eyelids, um, it's a little, bit, a little bit easier to get their visual fields. And so using the preliminary data uh, that Tyler was able to capture, we can project what their um, visual field looks like. And so the binocular field is where their binocular overlap is, and then the blue is where their, their blind spots are. So I'm really excited to see where this stuff goes. Um, up next for me, I have a postdoc appointment lined up at the University of Michigan working with Dr. Alice Rabowski. Um, and working with her, the plan is to basically supplement the genomic stuff that I've been doing um, in the sensory evolution of snakes, but then pairing it with um, high resolution uh, CT scanning morphology and try to pair the two together to look at the evolution of the genome with the evolution of the morphology in the head. So I'm really excited to start that. And with that, um, I have a bunch of people to thank. Uh, I have to thank our funding sources, the National Science Foundation, uh, Florida State, of course, and then the American Genetic Association. Um, I'd like to thank my dad. <laughs> my dad's here. <laughs> I do want to thank my dad, but I want to thank my lab, um, particularly Darren Rakita, who's been a great advisor over the years, um, and of course the rest of my lab as well. Um, including both past and, uh, and present. I want to thank my committee, uh, again, Darren, but also Joe, Scott, Peter, and Greg, and then some really uh, crucial collaborators, Chris Parkinson and Lila Gibbs. Um, I want to thank some key co contributors to this research, including Matt Holding, Andrew Mason, Carl Whittington, um, Mike Bro, Mark Margris, Tim Colston, and Kenny Ray. I want to thank uh, the FSU Biology Core, where I did a bunch of the prep work for my sequencing. Um, I want to thank the King admin staff and the custodial staff, uh, tech support, Alex, Josh. Uh, I used Popper for all my analyses, and so having that as a resource was you know, basically the only way I was able to do all of this stuff. Um, College of Medicine, where we did the bulk of our sequencing, and then LAR and ACUC for letting us keep rattlesnakes on campus. Um, and then, last but not least, I want to thank my support system, Alexa, and our cat, Wesley, who have been my rock throughout all of this. Um, and then my family, my, my parents are here today, so thank you for making the, the flight out here. And then all my friends that have made grad school a blast. Um, yeah, so, it was just a collage of some of my favorite memories. <laughs> But yeah, you guys really made Tallahassee feel like home, and um, I really enjoyed my, doing my degree here with all of you guys. So um, with that, I'll take any questions.